We'll start in just one more minute. Can everybody see the link in the chat box? I'll send it one more time in the chat uh, dialog. It's not a big deal if you don't see it. That's for those who'd like to print out the sources. But I will also be um, I will also be sharing my screen, so you'll be able to see on your screen the sources if you uh, if that's easier for you and you can't access the link that's uh, at the bottom of the page. I want to remind you all that uh, this class is being recorded and might be posted on the Beth Tikva website. So if you're camera shy and don't want to be on the web, uh, you can turn off your video by just clicking the stop video button and you can still fully participate in, in the lecture that way. Also, uh, the chat box is very handy uh, if you'd like to make comments or questions. I can't promise you because we have some material to cover today that I can get to every question, but uh, it would be helpful for you to write those questions down anyways because I could uh, email you directly after the class. We're going to keep a record of the questions, and sometimes I do have the chance to glance over and see uh, and learn from you and your comments and insights about what we're going to be learning. So good morning. This uh, class is themed, uh, obviously, on the high holidays. Uh, it's almost part two of a lecture that I enjoyed giving last year on Unatane Tokef. Uh, instead of looking at uh, sort of the themes of the days of awe, repentance, and which I think we've covered over the years already, I thought it might be interesting to give people insight into the Matsor, especially because um, I don't have time during the service, maybe I'll have a bit more time this year, but I don't have time to explain the depth and the wisdom and the richness of the prayers in the Machsor during our service. And I feel like it's such a waste because um, in a day and age where people really knew the Machsor and studied it deeply, but before they came to Shul, the prayers uh, had much more power but today we sort of come to show with our maksars in hand and open them up. And this is a really good maksar we use, which has some commentary on the side. But you'll see as we, as we review Avinu Malkenu, and those of you who learned Unatane Tokef with me last year, that there's not enough space on the page to cover all of uh, the background, the history, the insight of these prayers. And... Um, it's much better to have a session devoted beforehand to studying before we get to shul. Quite frankly, don't tell anybody, but I would rather do this on Rosh Hashanah than Davin, because my way of, of understanding um, uh, what it means to be Jewish is through Talmud Torah, through learning Torah. Instead of standing there for a master and going through the prayers, which is nice, um, it feels so much better to do so when we have learning the learning background before we get to that uh, before we get to that day. So now, those of you 57 now who are joining me in the classroom today, you're going to be able to really understand one of the most important prayers that we recite on the high holidays, called Avinu Malkeinu. Uh, Avinu Malkeinu is not recited actually this year on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. There's a very strange rule that says we don't recite Avinu Malkeinu on Shabbat. And this year, the first day of Rosh Hashanah is on Shabbat. It's reserved because it's a prayer with special power, reserved only when Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur occur on weekdays. And we're get, going to get to that question after, because I think first you need to understand where Avinu Malkeinu comes from. There is nowhere in the Torah where you will find the words together, Avinu Malkeinu. There's nowhere in the prophets where you'll see those two words, Avinu Malkeinu. There's nowhere in the writings where it says Avinu Malkeinu. The first time we come across these words together uttered, uttered in prayer 
are in the Talmud. So let's now look, I'm going to share my screen at where we find the words of Inu Malkinu, where they appear first, and that I think will really help us understand the context. Um, if you could please give me a thumbs up, if you can see the, can you see my screen? Thumbs up, okay, great. This, uh, this class is called Rabbi Akiva's Prayer, which is a hint to you about where I'm going with, uh, with the lecture today. Let's first give you some background. The Mishnah in Ta'anit, Ta'anit means fasting. Now, um, Avinu Malkeinu is recited not only on the high holidays, but it's also recited in synagogue on fast days. And actually, the, for instance, uh, Tisha B'Av, right? Or Shiva uh, Asar um, B'Tamuz. The origin of Avinu Malkeinu relates to fast days, not to uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It is not a high holiday prayer originally, it appears in the context of Yemei Tzom, a fast day. Now, specifically, not a mandatory fast day, but a fast day that is imposed by the leaders of the community. Why would the leaders of the community impose a fast day? Usually, it was because something was going wrong, seriously wrong, in the world around the Jewish community. It, it was often because of a drought. So the rabbis would declare, I'm not talking about uh, Tisha B'Av or Shiva Atar, Sar B'Tamuz. I'm talking about the rabbis declaring, today we have to fast because there hasn't been rain in weeks and weeks. Fasting is in Judaism like prayer. It's a way to get God's attention, to show uh, repentance, to show uh a sense of um, sadness at a situation. We take it upon ourselves to fast, and it's a way to get God's attention. You know that, by the way, from the book of Esther. Remember, um, Esther is nervous about going to the king, and out of her fear, her inclination isn't to pray, but it's to ask everybody to fast on her behalf, to evoke God's attention to the situation, and then maybe she will be saved in her dangerous encounter with the king. So that's the same, that's that's the same kind of background to fasting that we need to understand where Avinu Malkenu comes from. And let's look at what happens in synagogue when they declare a fast day. The Mishnah in Tanit says, Tanit means fasting. When they stand up to pray, this is on a fast day, uh, they bring down before the ark an old man conversant with the prayers, one who has children and whose house is empty of food, so that his heart is complete prayer. He recites before them 24 benedictions, the 18 recited daily, to which he adds six. So on a fast day, the leaders of the community declare today a fast day, the, there is a, a change in the prayer service in the synagogue. That's what we're learning here. The usual guy, in, that, in those days it was a guy, was not asked to daven. Today, you had to get the best guy. Who's the best guy? Is someone who's older, who knows the prayers very well. One who has children. What do you think that is about? That's interesting. Some people say it's because if you have children, you care more about the future than if you don't have children, right? Because you're seeing that if there's no rain, uh, if things don't go well in the world, uh, they, they have to inherit your problems as much as you will face your problems. And so... You have to have children, according to the Mishnah, in order to pray. 
Um, some people uh, think that it says you have to have children because you don't know what real heartache and pain is unless you have children. And you have to feel pain when you're, when you're up there davening. Your house has to be empty of food. That means you took your, your fasting very, very seriously. You didn't even want uh, to have food in your house, never mind in your stomach. And your heart has to be filled with prayer and we add some extra blessings in the Amida, which we do today too, by the way. If you look at the morning prayer service, it, there are a couple of places where it says, on a fast day, um, add this prayer. And uh, it's a special prayer for a fast day to get God's attention in a bad situation. Okay, so that's our background. The person who prays on a fast day has got to be somebody very, very special. Now, Cherry, you look very innocent sitting there. So, Cherry, I'm going to ask you if you could please read for us. Don't worry, it's in English. The source from the Babylonian Talmud. <laughs> Cherry, you are a scholar, so I know you, you're the appropriate person to read this. You're a shmooza. There was another incident involving Rabbi Eliezer who, descend, who descended to serve as prayer leader before the ark on a fast day. And he now, recited an 20... So the Talmud... Wait, I'm going to keep interrupting you, Cherry. Don't be offended. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, there's an incident that Talmud wants to tell us a story about Rabbi Eliezer. They asked him to be that guy in the previous, uh, in the previous section, right? We learned it's got to be a special guy to lead the service, okay? So that day, Rabbi Eliezer was the special guy. Keep going, Cherry. And he recited 24 blessings. But okay, he, was not, he did it the right way, but... He was no, not answered. Rabbi Akiva descended before the ark after him and said, Our father, our king, we have no king other than you. Our father, ah, our king. Welcome to Avinu Malkeinu. Here is where Avinu Malkeinu makes its introduction. Rabbi Eliezer wasn't answered. Whose prayer is this? It's Rabbi Akiva's prayer. He descends instead of Rabbi Eliezer because Rabbi Eliezer's prayers weren't answered. And he said, Avinu malkeinu ein lanu melech ela atta. And then what does he say? He says one more thing, Cherry. Our father, our king, for your sake, have mercy on us. Avinu malkeinu lema'ancha rachem aleinu. And by the way, over here on, on the next page, you see uh, for the more, my, the more advanced students among us, these six columns are different manuscripts of the Talmud. And there are textual differences here um, in, in the way Rabbi Akiva's Avinu Malkeinu prayers are, uh, are presented. So look here at this one. For those of you who know Hebrew, this manuscript from Machzor Vitri says, Avinu malkeinu chatanu lefanecha. That's a prayer that we're familiar to, right? This edition of the Talmud doesn't say that, the one up here. But uh, we can, you know, I, I could take up the whole class with where these textual emendations come from. But I just want to show you that Avinu malkeinu, in all of the manuscripts, it's just two this one over here has, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six different Avinu Malkenus that Rabbi Akiva recited. None have uh, the long list that we have in our machsers, right? I think we must have close to 30 in our, in our machser. Um, those were added over time. Over time, people added different Avinu Malkenus, give me this, give me that all uh, beginning with those two words. Rabbi Akiva just said two things, right? Avinu Malkeinu, for your sake have mercy on us. Avinu Malkeinu, we have no king other than you. And what happened, Cherry? And rain immediately fell. The sages were whispering among themselves that Rabbi Akiva was answered while his teacher Rabbi Eliezer was not. Oh, look what has So among the congregation, people were saying, Oi, do you see what just happened? He recite Rabbi Eliezer, the wisest person. By the way, Rabbi Eliezer was Rabbi Akiva's teacher. 
So Rabbi Eliezer, 24 blessings. He's, he's a scholar. He's praying his heart out on that fast day. And Rabbi Akiva basically says, Avinu malkeinu ein lanu melech el And that's it. <laughs> the rains suddenly fell. A divine voice. A divine voice emerged and said, it is not because this sage, Rabbi Akiva, is greater than that one. Rabbi ah. Eliezer... Carry on. Sure. Rabbi yeah, yeah, Eliezer... Yeah, but that this one is forgiving, and that one is not forgiving. God responded to Rabbi Akiva's forgiving nature in kind by sending rain. So look at the story of Avinu Malkeinu. This is fascinating, this source, and nobody knows it. Everyone thinks Avinu Malkeinu is just a poem. It's a composition. They forget that this is a prayer that belongs to somebody. Somebody created this prayer. And its uh, power is in the context of this very story that we're reading right now. Related very much to the guy who said it and his nature. The, look at the miracle that happens. People were talking, oh my God, look at this. The student has surpassed his teacher, Rabbi Akiva, must be greater than Rabbi Eliezer. And God himself comes down and says, no, it is not because one is greater than another. In the Hebrew, one is not gadol mizeh. One is not bigger than another. It's about something specific in Rabbi Akiva that Rabbi Eliezer doesn't have. What is it? In the Hebrew, I want to focus on the Hebrew, ze ma'avir amidotav, ze eno ma'avir amidotav. Ma'avir amidotav. Now, last year, I reviewed the words of Unetane Tokef. The, there was um, one word or a root, a Hebrew root word that I was trying to submit to you was the key to understanding all of Unetanatokeh. The Hebrew word, root word was ayin bet resh. Uh, Ma'avir tsono tachat shifto. Ayin Bet Resh appears here again. Ma'avir Almidotav. Do you see that word? Ma'avir Almidotav. Here it is translated, one is forgiving and one is not forgiving. But that's not what Ma'avir Almidotav means literally. What is the root Ayin Bet Resh? Uh, what are some of you who know Hebrew know that it's connected to many different words? The words Aveira, a sin, Aveira, comes from that root word. Laavor is to cross over, it can even mean to die. Ibur in Hebrew means to be pregnant. Um, and, and many more meetings, meanings. Ma'avir al Midotav. I would say the closest literal translation here was passes over ma'avir al midotav, his attributes. Midot are attributes. One passes over his attributes and one does not. Now this English translation here says that's what, that, that must mean he's forgiving. Do you understand why it makes that conclusion? Because our attributes, our attributes are our human nature. And Rabbi Akiva could transcend his nature, his nature to be angry, to be vengeful. He could pass it over and pass those traits over and be more forgiving. That's where this English translation might come from. Because we know a little bit 
through other sections of the Talmud, and frankly, I could have presented dozens of them, but we're only going to do a couple today. We know from other sections of the Talmud a little bit about how Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer had different personalities. And what I want you to keep in mind is that God himself descends to this congregation and says, it's not because Rabbi Akiva said the magic words. I wasn't waiting to send rain until you called me Avinu Malkeinu. And I wasn't waiting for specifically Rabbi Akiva, who was a great scholar. Why did God send rain to Rabbi Akiva's prayer? Because of a particular quality that Rabbi Akiva had that Rabbi Eliezer did not have. And it was the quality of ma'avir al-midotav, being, um, passing over his, uh, I want to translate it literally here, passing over his attributes. Thank you, Cherry. Now, I want you to see that a different version of this story that appears in the Jerusalem Talmud that I think emphasizes my point. Uh, Maria, would you be able to read um, this uh, passage for us from the Jerusalem Talmud? You, you know that before the Babylonian Talmud was edited, uh, there was a, a Talmud that was printed in the Galilee. We call that the Jerusalem Talmud. And uh, very often the same stories are told in the Babylonian Talmud, usually a little more in the Babylonian Talmud, there's a little bit more detail, but an abbreviated version is often found in the Jerusalem Talmud. So that's the case with this story. Let's take a look at it. Ria, thank you for volunteering, being voluntold, <laughs> what they voluntold to read. Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer made a fast, but no rain fell. So Rabbi, in this version of the story, we're told that Rabbi Eliezer is also the one who called the fast. Go ahead. Rabbi Akiva made a fast and the rain fell. Ah, his fast worked. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva wow. entered and said before them, I will explain it in a parable. What is it like? Like a king who had two daughters. One was brazen, chutzpadik, and one was proper. When the brazen one wanted to enter before him, he said, give her what she wants so that she may go away. When the proper one wanted to enter before him, he was patient because he liked hearing her please. Is Look it what a beautiful, I'm gonna stop you there. Look what a beautiful politician, Rabbi Akiva must have been a pulpit rabbi. Look what a beautiful politician Rabbi Akiva is. His teacher, Rabbi Eliezer, his fast didn't work. But Rabbi Akiva's fast did work. So, it, so we would expect that people would be saying, oh my God, we, Rabbi Akiva, you are greater than Rabbi Eliezer. And Rabbi Akiva says, no, 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 no. Let me explain to you what's happening. Hashem likes Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer is his favorite chazan. When you have your favorite guy praying to you, you don't tell him to stop, I'll give you what you want. You enjoy hearing his prayers. So Rabbi Akiva, look what a great politician he is towards his teacher. It's not that I'm bigger than, than he is. It's that God wanted to get rid of me. He doesn't like Rabbi Akiva's prayers. So he says, okay, just give Rabbi Akiva what he wants so he goes away. I'll send the rain. But Rabbi Eliezer, I want Rabbi Eliezer to keep praying so that, um, uh, so that I get to hear the sweetness of his prayers. What does that teach you all? Think about what that teaches us about Rabbi Akiva. What do you learn about Rabbi Akiva from this story? Not just that he was a good politician. Look at the deference he shows to his teacher. Look at the respect. Look at his running away from honor. Does this help us a little bit understand Ma'avir al-Midotav, what God saw in Rabbi Akiva? I think it does. God saw in Rabbi Akiva, what a wonderful person. Look how he doesn't want to take any credit. All He could say, yeah, of course, 
my fast worked. I'm better than Rabbi Eliezer. But he doesn't say that. He says, God just wanted to get rid of me. That's why he gave me what I wanted. He wanted me to stop praying. Rabbi Eliezer's prayers are so sweet, God didn't want to answer them too quickly. Now look what the Talmud says. Now re read this last sentence. Is it permissible to say this? Rather is it permissible to say this? The, the, the Talmud is saying, hold on, Rabbi Akiva? Was a chut, the, is the chutzpahdik daughter. He's like one of the greatest teachers in, he's one of the greatest teachers in our tradition. Are we really saying to everybody, we're publicizing now that he was a chutzpahdik daughter? So what does the Talmud answer? Rather, it was to prevent blasphemy of the house of Rabbi Eliezer. Ah, shelo lechalel shen shamayim Rabbi Eliezer. It's because people were talking and they were saying, Rabbi Eliezer is not, doesn't, his prayers are not effective. God doesn't listen to Rabbi Eliezer. So we're basically telling you this parable not to say that Rabbi Akiva was the chutzpahdik daughter. We're saying it to pre, for, for political reasons, to prevent talk about Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Akiva was trying to cover for his teacher. Isn't that interesting? Now we learn about, this is the same story, but is, does, do the words Avinu Malkeinu even appear in this version? No. So what are we learning here when you compare these two stories? Certainly for me, what we're learning is that the, the point of Avinu Malkeinu, the context of that story, is not about magic words that suddenly open sesame, the gates of heaven. It, Avinu Malkeinu are not two words that are more powerful than any other words. But the prayer Avinu Malkeinu reminds us of this story. Because that's where these words came from. And what those stories teach us are not to pray sincerely, are not to say, it's not to say the right words, it's to be the kind of person that Rabbi Akiva was. Both versions of the story point to the same innate qualities of Rabbi Akiva that almost command God's attention and cause him to send the rain. Now you're getting a sense of why I don't think we should call Avinu Malkeinu, Avinu Malkeinu. We should always call it the prayer of Rabbi Akiva so that we might model who he was. Ma'avir al-Midotav, the guy who who didn't insist on being the center of attention, who didn't want credit for having his prayers answers, who defended his, even his rivals and made sure that they got honor when people were speaking ill against them. Isn't that amazing? And nobody knows this unless they came to my class this morning. Let's keep learning about who Rabbi Eliezer was and who Rabbi Akiva was. Thank you, Ria. You, you are a wonderful, wonderful uh, reader. Violette, would you kindly read for us this story involving Rabbi Eliezer? Are you able to unmute? Norman, are you able to unmute? There you go. Yes, now. Okay, so can you guys read? Violet, you can read. The sages taught. This one? The sages taught. He wants you to read it. Oh, the sages taught. An incident occurred involving Rabbi Eliezer, who decreed the complete cycle of 13 fasts upon the congregation. But rain did not fall. Look at this, is another story in the Talmud of Rabbi Eliezer 
decreeing a fast. Not just one, 13 fasts. So things must have been very, very bad. He declares 13 fasts on the congregation and none of them work. The rain did not fall. At the end of the last fast, the congregation began to exit the synagogue. He said to them, have you prepared graves for yourselves? If rain does not fall, we will all die of hunger. All the people burst into tears and rain fell. Now here, thank you so much, Violet. Here, I want us to pay attention. We're learning a little bit about Rabbi Akiva. Now here we can learn a little bit of something about Rabbi Eliezer. What happened in this scene? What does this teach you, this story, about Rabbi Eliezer's character? At the end of the last fast, the people, very sad, I'm sure, left the synagogue. All of his colleagues and friends and congregants are walking out after 13 fast days. Imagine how weak and disappointed they are. What would a good rabbi say to people at a time like that? Have you prepared graves for yourselves? That's what Rabbi Eliezer said? It's almost like he's blaming them, saying, it's not my fault. You obviously aren't praying properly. You obviously are so bad. You're such a lousy shul that God doesn't even want to listen to you after 13 fasts. Get your graves ready. That's what Rabbi Eliezer says to them. If rain does not fall, we'll all die of hunger. Oh my God, now he's... Now he's making the situation even worse. Do you know now what's going to happen? We're all going to die. This is like, imagine being stuck on a, on a, on a ship at, in a crisis with this guy. Imagine being on a lifeboat with Rabbi Eliezer. Who would push him off the boat? Do you know what's going to happen now? We're all going to die. We're all going to die. Be quiet. That's not what we want to hear from somebody. We want encouragement. We want positivity. We want you to help cheer us up. Instead, you're telling us we're all going to die of hunger? All the people burst into tears and rain fell. Did God respond to Rabbi Eliezer? No. What caused God to respond? The people were crying so much because... I mean, look, at one, one rabbi might say to you, the people were crying because there was no rain that was falling. I read this story a little bit differently. I read it deeper. You can take it or leave it. I think they're crying because their rabbi is a jerk and abandoned them and made them feel even worse about their situation. And God had pity on these poor people stuck with such a lousy rabbi that he caused the, the rain to fall. Look at the difference between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva. The picture the Talmud is painting of both of them. One, Ma'avir al-Midotav, passes over his attributes. The other one, <laughs> it looks like his attributes have totally, his negative attributes, totally control his emotions and his behavior. When he's angry, he's angry. When he's disappointed, don't expect any compassion from him. And I think the same thing here uh, you will find in this last story that I think is a great uh, story that compares their two uh, personalities, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi uh, Eliezer. Rini, would you read this? Uh, Rini Katz, would you, would you kindly read this for us? Thank you. From, from another part of the Talmud. You have to unmute. The sages taught the following Baraita. Baraita is, like is like a teaching. What was the order of teaching the oral law? How was the oral law first taught? 
Moses learned directly from the mouth of the Almighty. Aaron, so how did the oral law get started? God told Moses the oral law, right? You all know that there's the written law, but we know how that got started. That's the scroll of the Torah, right? But how did the oral law get started? Think about, you know, the, the written law says, put a mezuzah on your door, but the oral law says, and you put it on the right side of the door, and it has to be tilted a little bit forward. That's not in the Torah. That's the oral law. So how did it get started? It started from God. God told Moses. Then what happened, Greeny? Aaron entered and sat before him, and Moses taught him his lesson as he had learned it from God. Aaron okay. moved aside and sat to the left of Moses. Aaron's sons entered, and Moses taught them their lesson while Aaron listened. Aaron's sons moved aside. Eleazar sat to the right of Moses, and Itamar sat to the left of Aaron. Rabbi That's, uh, those are Eleazar and Itamar, those are Aaron's sons. So th this is how they're sitting. They're sitting in a yeshiva, and there's Moses in the middle. By the way, nobody likes Moses' kids. You know in Judaism, in, in, in Jewish tradition, Moses' kids are lousy. Um, Aaron has two sons that are lousy, but there are two sons that are good. So these are the two sons that are good. Um, Moses is teaching Aaron and also Aaron's sons, the two good sons, uh, how to, um, how to, all the teachings of the oral law. Rabbi Yehuda disagreed with the first Tanakh with regard to the seating arrangements, and he said, Actually, Aaron would return to sit to the right of Moses. The elders entered and Moses taught them their lesson. The elders moved aside and the entire nation entered and Moses taught them their lesson. So Aaron don't worry about that passage about where everybody's seating. Don't ask me why the rabbis are arguing about seating arrangements. That's great. I guess it's a Jewish tradition that, that's been passed on from generation to generation. I have no clue why Rabbi Yehuda says no, they were, Aaron was on the other side of Moses. I will look into that for you if you're really curious. What's important now is that after Aaron's sons learn, then the elders come in and Moses teaches them. Therefore, Aaron had heard the lessons four times. His sons heard it three times. The elders heard it twice. And the entire nation heard it once. Everyone's, everyone understands because Aaron was in the room. He stayed in the room with Moses when his kids came in to learn their lesson. So Aaron heard it four times. Moses then departed oops, to his tent. And Aaron taught the others his lesson as he had learned it from Moses. Aaron then departed, and his sons taught the others their lesson. His sons then departed, and the er elders taught the rest of the people their lesson. Hence, everyone, Aaron, his sons, the elders, and all the people heard the lessons taught by God four times. So this is how we get to the number four times, right? Because all everyone's hearing the lessons a few times from a few different people. But that's not the important part. Now we're going to get to what we learn about this section about Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva. Go ahead, Rini. Okay. From here, Rabbi Eliezer said, a person is obliged to teach a student his lesson four times. And it follows by way of a fortiori interference. If Aaron had, if Aaron, who learned from Moses himself, and Moses had received the Torah directly from the mouth of the Almighty, needed his, this regiment. An ordinary student learning from the mouth of an ordinary teacher. How much more so must he review his studies four times? Ah, so what is Rabbi Eliezer's belief about education? When you're teaching students the material, we need to follow the example of Aaron and Moses. A Mo Moses himself, who's a better teacher than Moses, right? But still, Aaron needed to hear the lessons four times. And Rabbi Eliezer says, from this we learn how to teach our students when we go through a lesson. We repeat the lesson three other times in addition to the first time, and that's the rule. 
Now, what does Rabbi Akiva say in response? Go ahead, Rini. From where, Rabbi Akiva says, from where do we derive that a person is obliged to teach his student until he learns the material and understands it? Aha! Look at the disagreement between the two of them and think about what this shows about their personalities. Rabbi Eliezer says four times. That's what, that's the rule. And Rabbi Akiva says, no, until the student learns and understands the material. In other words, you teach them until they learn it. A hundred times, if necessary. And he learns that because it says, put the Torah in their mouths. Right, you see at the bottom of this passage, Simat Befihem. That's a verse that we learn. So if it says you put the Torah in their mouths, then they need to be able to teach it to others. That's why it says you put the lesson in their mouth and not in their heads. If you put it in their head, they might not understand it well enough to be able to share it with others. But if you put it in their mouth, it means that not only do they understand what you're telling them, that they are able to teach it to others. And therefore, the tradition can be passed on from generation to generation. What is it showing you about Rabbi Akiva's sensitivity to other people? Isn't this sort of in line with what, we've, what we're already learning about him? and sort of Rabbi Eliezer's lack of compassion on people? Rabbi Eliezer sounds like a mean, nasty guy. Four times, that's the rule, four times. And if you don't get it by then, then you're dumber than the people who learned from Moses, right? Moses, the greatest teacher in the world, four times they had to learn his lesson, and that's it. If you can't learn it in four times, you you know you you don't you shouldn't learn it at all. And uh, and Rabbi Akiva, much more in tune with, I think, real education, which uh, which means real education is not uh, looking at your students as all identical, each one learning according to her own way. And that's Rabbi Akiva's view of education, which I think teaches us more about his personality. Okay, thank you, Rini. I appreciate that. I just want to show you here some places where this word ma'avir al midotav, right? The first, um, the first thing we learned about Rabbi Akiva, his quality of passing over his attributes, how it features prominently in chapter 33 of Exodus, in God talking about himself. Look what it says in Exodus 33. Vayomer, ani avir kol tuvi al panecha. God says, I will make my goodness pass before you. And again here, Vesakoti kapi alecha ad ovri. My glory will pass by you. And at the bottom, these words that we are a little bit more familiar with, Vayavor Hashem al panav vayikra. You remember that from the High Holiday Liturgy? Um, and the Lord passed before, passed by before him and proclaimed. Now that's an important section because remember the theme of the high holidays is God forgiving us. And right before we recite these words, the 13 attributes of God, Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum, the Chanun, God, O God, who is merciful and compassionate, we read the words, Vaya'avor, God passed by. Just like Rabbi Akiva is ma'avir. 
make that connection in your minds that the same words that are being used to describe Rabbi Akiva are being used to describe God in this, one of the top uh, 10 most important sections of the Hebrew Bible that happen to deal with forgiveness. The connection between la avor, to pass over, and forgiveness is in the Bible, relates to God, just like we're connecting those two with Rabbi Akiva, just like, by the way, we learned last year when we were talking about Unatan Tokef and that word, ma'avir tsono, tachat shivto, that word, la'avor, again, appears in Unatan Tokef. Here's another passage from the Bible that talks about la avor. Mi el kamocha no se avon over al pesha. God passes by transgression. Over al pesha. What, is, what do we learn here about la avor, what it means? It means God sees you doing something wrong, but God forgives. God doesn't notice. God skips over it. Does this help us understand a little bit about who Rabbi Akiva was? Here's another insight into that word, la'avor. Can somebody read this section for me? Miriam, are you okay to read? Okay, not Miriam. Not Miriam. Let's, let, Miriam, you want to read? No. Okay, so what about you, Stan? <clears throat> yes. Okay, Rava understood the verse differently. Rava understood this verse differently and said, <clears throat> with regard to whoever forgoes his reckonings with others. So here, look at the Hebrew. Rava Amar Hama'avir al Tav. So here, the same words that were being used to describe Rabbi Akiva, Rava is now explaining what that means. So this might also give us a hint about Rabbi Akiva's personality, because right. the same uh, words that are being used to describe him are being explained in this section. So what does Rab Rava say, Stan? Um. He says, with, with regard to whoever foregoes his reckonings with others for injustices done to him, the heavenly court in turn foregoes punishment for all his sins, as it is stated, he bears sin and forgives transgression. Over al pesha. So whose sins does he bear? The sins of one who foregoes his reckonings with others for injustices committed against him. So I want to explain to you, this is an important source in the Talmud, a beautiful, beautiful source about what it means that God is described as ma'avir al-midotav. God passes by his attributes. According to Rava, that means God foregoes punishment. In other words, God will not punish those who forgives who forgive others. Do you understand that? It's a it's there in the English, which regard, but it's just a bit confused. With regard to whoever forgoes his reckonings, in other words, I've got a fight with my brother-in-law, and I'm going to forgive him. If I act towards my brother-in-law that way, then God will forgive me. God is forgiving to the one who forgives others. God literally passes over. He bears my sin. God bears my sin means God doesn't put the sin on me. He takes it away from me. Whose sin does he bear? The sins of one who forgoes his reckonings with others for injustices committed against him. So then Rashi makes the obvious connection between what that means for God and what it might mean for an individual. And he says, Stan, can you read this section? Who is not... Sorry, yes, Rashi, Go ahead. Rashi says, who passes over his, 
retaliations, who is, in, who is not exacting in measuring out relations for those who trouble him, rather than setting aside his retaliations and moving on. That should be retaliations, not relations. Sorry, that's my Reta title. Retaliations. Thank you, Thank you Stan. So it's who is the one who is ma'avir al midotav, which are the same words were, that are being used to describe Rabbi Akiva. He was somebody who was not exacting in measuring out retaliations for the people who sinned against him. Rabbi Akiva had a lot of people, in other words, who maybe disappointed him, upset him, but Rabbi Akiva didn't let it get to him. He never acted towards that person in a, in a mean way, sort of in a, in a revenge, in a vengeful way. That's what Rashi is saying about what we learn here in this passage about Ma'avir al Midotav. Now, this teaches us, I think, what the role is of the story in our liturgy. Because we think Avinu Malkeinu is about the words that were uttered. And I'm submitting to you that it's not about the words at all. Avinu Malkeinu calls to mind a human quality. When we say those words, no matter how many requests we make in Avinu Malkeinu, our minds are supposed to connect to Rabbi Akiva and to his ability to get over, pass over, any anger he had, right? Rab, uh, Rashi's words here, if you look, a no midak dek. You know, Rabbi Akiva, midak dek is someone who's checking everything. In other words, Rabbi Akiva, if he was a, an angry person, would make sure that all the people who deserved it got their due somehow in life. But Rabbi Akiva wasn't like that. He was ma'avira midotav, didn't check, didn't care about people who were angry, uh, who had bothered him, who had sinned against others. And this final passage, I think, connects everything together. Um, and then I'll, I'll make a statement just in general uh, about, about what we're learning today. Um, Abe, would you read this last section, Abe Rutenberg? Are you able to unmute? Thank you. Uh, brachot, brachot. From here we see that the Holy One, blessed be he, prays. So in the tractate brachot, which is all about prayer, it says not only do we pray, God prays too. Now you should all be shocked, right? Right at the beginning of this, right? God prays. Well, who does He pray to, and what does He pray? Why would God feel the need to pray? So this is going to be interesting. Keep going, Abe. Gemara asks, "What does God pray?" Rav Zutra Batovia said that Rav said, "God says." May it be my will that my mercy will overcome my anger towards Israel with its transgressions. And may my mercy prevail over my other attributes or through, through which Israel is punished. And may I conduct myself toward my children, Israel, with the attribute of mercy. And may I enter before them beyond the letter of the law. And I underlined here in the Hebrew the the Yigolo Rachamai al Midotai. There's that word again, Midot, my attributes. May God's prayer is may my mercy overcome my anger. All the other attributes which say punish people, punish the the punish my people because they're lousy? No. May I deal with them 
in a merciful way. That's God's prayer. So now I want to connect everything. God himself is praying every day, may I be merciful. Here is the Avinu Malkeinu prayer, which we've learned today isn't about saying any magic words, but it is about being in tune with the very same quality that God prays that he should have. The quality of being forgiving, being merciful, not being exacting or angry when somebody disappoints you, uh, passing by transgression, la avor, to ignore when people you know and, and love do something wrong. So when you're going up before the ark and saying Avinu Malkeinu, what is actually going on? I would submit to you that what we're trying to do in that prayer is remind God about his own prayers. It's a, it's a crazy thing, but, but I, I really believe that that's what is being told in this story. When we go up there and say, Avinu malkeinu chatanu lefanecha, we're tapping into that attribute of Rabbi Akiva and telling God, remember once upon a time, there was a man who recited this prayer. And because he was so forgiving of others, it reminded you, O oh God, of the prayer that you recite for yourself. So remember what you pray for. Because here we are, a bunch of people who have certainly disappointed you in the past year. Avinu malkeinu chatanu lefanecha. Our Father, our King, we messed up. But you don't want to punish us. If you wanted to yell at us and scream at us and, and get angry at us, well, then you'd be like Rabbi Eliezer. And remember, you didn't like Rabbi Eliezer. So don't you be like Rabbi Eliezer. We're telling God, no, you be like Rabbi Akiva. We know that's what you, God, really want. We know you really want to be like Rabbi Akiva because you pray to be like Rabbi Akiva yourself. You want to get over your attributes. You want your mercy to be more powerful than anything else. And so if we're choosing a person to pray on our behalf, it's, it's interesting what we learn from this section. There are some sections of, of uh, the, the code books of Jewish law that emphasize that first source we learned. Get an old man with children who knows the prayers perfectly and has a pleasant voice. That's what we want. It's about a person who's pleasing to the congregation and, and to God. What do all these stories tell about the kind of person who should be leading the prayers? You want a person who is so compassionate and forgiving and slow to anger and patient with others in his personal life, that God will look down on that person and say, oh, this guy reminds me <laughs> of how I need to be. I guess I shouldn't be angry because Chazen Kavari is such a nice guy and isn't, doesn't get angry at anybody very easily. You know what? I, I want to be more like him. That's God talking. I want to be more like him. It would be blasphemous, and some of you are, might think to myself, Rabbi, how can you talk about God that way? That's blasphemous. But I'm reading it from the, from the, from the Talmud. I didn't come up with these words. In Tractate Brachot, we read, even God needs to pray. It's, it, because that's the hardest thing in life. 
when you're really angry, when, when you see people who really deserve to be punished, the hardest thing in life is to be ma'avira midotav, to just ignore it. It's so hard that even God struggles. And by the way, the Bible is full of those kinds of stories of God himself struggling with, should I kill these people? Should I not kill these people? Should I forgive them? Should I not forgive them? It's the famous argument with Abraham and God right at the beginning, right? Sdom and Amorah. God says, uh, these people deserve to die. Abraham says, come on, I'm sure I can find a few righteous people in this city and you can spare them. Right? With the sin of the spies. God says, that's it. The spies came back and gave him a lousy report of the land. I should get rid of all of them. And Moses says, no, 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 forgive us. You know you want to forgive us. You know you want to forgive us, forgive us. And God says, Salachti kidvarecha, I will forgive them. We have an image of God that's even painted in the Bible as somebody who wrestles with mercy. Do I really want to be mercy? Do I really not want to be mercy? Merciful. And uh, that is the struggle of every father. Avinu, every parent, I would say. You want to be compassionate towards your kids, but if you're too compassionate, they'll, uh, they won't learn. Sometimes they have to be punished. It's the lesson of every parent, the struggle of every parent. When should I be strict? When should I be lenient? I was fighting with my daughter about that just this morning. She wanted to have a sugar cereal, which I hate, one of these cocoa cereals. And she's yelling at me, why are you so strict? It's a struggle of every Avinu and the strug struggle of every Malkainu, the struggle of every king. If a king is too cruel towards his people, what are they going to do? They'll, get, they'll, throw, they'll, they'll overthrow him. A king also has to be balanced. When should I be strict? When should I not be strict? And we take these struggles and we recognize that they are at the heart of the process of tshuva, the, the heart of the process of repentance. And if I am merciful towards other people, then maybe God will be merciful for me and when merciful to me. And when I am praying, I have to make sure that not just the words that I speak are correct. But the emotion with which I come to prayer is not, um, is not, uh, is correct. The emotion with which I come to prayer is one that fits, I would say, what Rabbi Akiva is demonstrating here. In these and many, many stories, I like that story about his education, right? The way Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva teach differently. Because um, I, I think Rabbi Akiva here is giving us insight into what it means to be ma'avira midotav. If you understand people, you will understand that nobody is perfect and everyone's different. So as an educator, as a great educator, Rabbi Akiva arrives at a place in his life where he's naturally more forgiving. Because a good educator doesn't just go through the drills. Here's the math lesson for today. One, two, three, four times. Have a nice day. I'm done. A good educator wants Torah b'fihem. I want my students to be able to even teach this material themselves. And if that's the goal uh, with our students, that's the way we act as a teacher. It almost naturally inclines our spirits to be understanding of others, to be empathetic towards others. And empathy and understanding, those are the keys to being forgiving. Because you'll recognize uh, that everyone deals with their own struggles and nobody is perfect. So now when you get to, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about this prayer. And I hope when you get to Avinu Malkeinu, 
this year, which will be recited on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. I hope when you get to it, you won't pay too close attention to the words. And you won't hear me say that very often when it comes to prayer, but for this one, I say it. Don't get the Hebrew right. That's, that's not, I think, the key to Avinu Malkeinu. Remember where the words came from. They came from a man who lived 2,000 years ago, who was so forgiving of others, so committed to understanding people and where they were coming from, that he grew, if you know Rabbi Akiva's story, to develop a yeshiva of thousands and thousands of students. Remember, some of you know we, um, we don't do weddings the, traditionally during the Omer period. It's a time of sadness between a Pesach and Shavuot. Do you remember why we, it's a time of sadness? It's because there was a plague that killed thousands and thousands of whose students? Not Rabbi Eliezer's students. Rabbi Akiva's students. And now you see why so many people wanted to learn from him and why he became a transformative figure in Jewish history. It wasn't because he was so smart. Being so smart, that's, that's overemphasized. If you think back to the teachers who made the biggest impact on your lives, was it, was it the smartest ones? I can think of so many teachers I had that I thought were so brilliant and they were the worst teachers ever. Their intelligence had nothing to do with their ability to teach. The ones that were my best teachers were the ones whose approach towards learning was, let me teach this in a way where it reaches Bethlehem where it reaches you so deeply that you could teach these lessons yourself if you wanted to. Through experience, through demonstration, through caring, that's how you develop the reputation and the ability to be a great teacher. And that's Rabbi Akiva. That's the figure that we celebrate. That's the figure that we tap into at this most important moment of the year, in one of our most important prayers, Avinu Malkeinu, what we want is for Rabbi Akiva's spirit to be, um, I think, to come alive again. So may we all merit that generations from now, we, they might still be talking about what we taught them, not because we reviewed the lesson four times, but because we cared by the way we live our lives and the and the messages we convey that uh, that others um, that others learn from us in such a way where eventually they could become role models themselves in those very lessons. So I wish you all uh, shana tova, and uh, now I hope a prayer experience that is slightly deeper because uh, we spend time learning about this prayer. Thanks for your attention. And if you want to uh, email me uh, to receive these sources uh, in a PDF format, you can do so. Also, just a reminder that in the chat box, you can download them uh, right now if you have access to the chat box and you can print those out. Wishing you all a wonderful day. Take care.